Hello, my name is Stuart Clark. I'm the Minister of Melbourne Baptist Church and I want to welcome you to our online service today. And it's All Hallows Day today. Uh, and it's when parts of the church are celebrating the lives of those who have brought examples of discipleship uh, through human history. Um, these celebrated saints have lived uh, and they've encountered the miraculous nature of God through amazing prayer lives. And uh, much of the church really focus on them today. And today we are focusing on miraculous moments in the early church history of prayer. We see the church grow in faith in Acts 12, 1 to 17, as their prayer lives participate in a miraculous way. And it's great to be able to meet later on today as we have a time to reflect on peace this evening at 6.30 to 7.30. And uh, I do hope that I'll see you there at church. And don't forget to book in with Dawn. That would be great to see you. Next week, we are celebrating remembrance in our online service. And we will also set up from Wednesday of this week to the end of Wednesday the following week, across some netting and an area that poppies can be attached to, to bring a moment of tribute and remembrance outside the church. And so you will need to, I guess, buy some poppies or, which is even better, make some poppies. And, uh, and we'll have a time of, we won't have a time of gathering for this, but this will be just like an open tribute for the village to remember those who have made the sacrifice of life for our freedom. We haven't got an interview today, but if any of you want to share something God is doing in your life, we would love to hear from you. Do give us a, a phone call in the mountain and it would be great uh, to have an interview. Once again, I want to thank Beth and Andy for the missionary prayers this week. And thanks go to Emily who's recording a new song for us today. Thank you. And thanks for Matt for, for his editing skills. Again, brilliant. Galatians 5, 1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So let's come to God in prayer as we think about the freedom we have in Christ. Lord, what a gift you've given. What a heavenly treasure we hold. What a fragile inheritance you have entrusted us to our care. What a blessing is ours. What a responsibility we have for freedom is your gift and must be handled with care. Lord, we praise you for the freedom we have to think and to choose. For the freedom to learn and to share what we've learnt. For the freedom to discover who we are and why we are here. Lord, the freedom you give is what makes us who we are. And the freedom you give makes us responsible for the choices we make. We praise you, Lord, for the freedom to worship and to confess your Lord, even in these difficult times of restrictions, for the freedom to serve you, Lord, in what we do and who we are. We long to demonstrate your love, Lord, in words, works and wonders with our lives. Moments we speak of you, Lord, our Saviour, to others so that they too might know your freedom, that you might bring life to them through your death. Lord, we praise you for your freedom in Jesus. We praise you for your death on the cross where our freedom was paid for and for Jesus, your amazing resurrection that brought your gift of eternal freedom beyond death. And so, Lord, we thank you for this freedom. And again, we simply thank you that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And we can stand firm, no longer burdened again by a yoke of slavery. We want to thank you, Lord, for the freedom you bring us. Amen. Let's now in singing about that freedom, we're going to sing great things that reminds us again how God has brought that freedom into our lives. Let's sing greater things.
Hi, I'm Beth and I'm one of the missionary secretaries at Melbourne Baptist Church and it's that time again. To be honest, I'm not exactly sure where the last month has gone. Um, firstly, can I just say a quick thank you to all of you who um, gave money um, in the past uh, month for the um, BMS appeal. We managed to raise over £150, which will pay for two weeks worth of nursing care at the hospital in Chad. So that's made me very happy. Thank you all very, very much. Um, we've had some updates from some of our missionaries we support, but um, not a lot this month. As I say, it's crept up on Andy and I uh, rather as well. So um, we were perhaps a bit late sending out our email requests. Um, but we do pray for John and Sue Wilson. They're a couple who work for the Baptist Missionary Society BMS in Paris in France. Um, they'd like us to give thanks that their church is still able to meet and to pray that this will continue without difficulty or disruption. Um, on the 2nd of November, the National Baptist Congress takes place. The aim is to conclude all the administrative business for the year and to recognise four pastors, four new pastors, as they begin their ministry. And then John and Sue are hoping to take a week's holiday very soon, um, and they pray that that will be a really refreshing time for them. Uh, for Phil and Rosemary Halliday, again, they work for BMS. They're based in Massey, which is just north of Paris. Sadly, Rosemary's dad died after a short illness earlier in October. Um, both she and Phil were in Scotland with her and her family at the time. Um, they're currently on holiday and we don't have an update, but like John and Sue, their church continues to meet and Phil will be at the National Baptist Congress on the 2nd. And we pray for Gareth. Bethan, Sam, Jonah and Eva Shrubsole. Uh, they're based with BMS in Chad at Guinea 2 Hospital. The hospital continues to be busy and the rainy season means that there's been an increase in malaria cases. The hospital continues not only to provide care for those who are sick, but also important health education advice. And for David, Marlene, Joanna and Susanna, who are based with OM in Vienna in Austria, we continue to pray for David and his work for Operation Mobilisation and for Mylene as she works alongside the refugee population. And lastly, for Christ's Hope, which is a charity in Africa that is supported by many within our congregation. Um, this month, we're particularly going to remember the Rehoboth Ministry Care Centre in Namibia. They ask us to thank God for his unfailing love and protection and that the children at the care point are safe and sound. And they ask for prayer for the spiritual growth of their teenagers 
and that the lunch date they've planned with the local community to introduce the work of Christ's hope will be successful. Let's take a few moments to pray together. We come together, Lord, in what may seem uncertain times, but we thank you that we have the reassurance of your love and comfort. We give thanks that the churches in France can still meet together and we pray for the congregations at John and Sue's and Phil and Rosemary's church. May they continue to be able to gather together safely and spend time as a community. We pray for the National Baptist Congress as it meets on the 2nd of November. We ask that all the practicalities of the business can be completed at the meeting. And we pray for the four ministers who are going to be commissioned, that you will bless them and their families in their future ministry. We pray for the Shrub Soul family. We give thanks for the continued work that they do in the hospital in their different capacities. We pray that the hospital will be able to cope with the increased workload that the risk of malaria may bring. And we pray for continued good health and protection for all the family as they work in that situation. For the Fry family, we give thanks for David's continued commitment and enthusiasm for his role at OM. Bless him as he uses that to share your love. And for Marlene as she works alongside the refugee population. We know that she is a real source of love and comfort to those families who are in very difficult circumstances. May she continue to be a beacon of light in these often dark circumstances. And for Christ's hope in Rehoboth, we give thanks for your unfailing love and protection on the families. And we ask that the teenagers will see what a difference a relationship with you can make. We pray to you for our world. We pray for those who are scared. And we think of Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe as she faces another trial in Iran on Monday. We pray for those who mourn and remember the families of Rasul Iran Najad, Shiva Mohammed Panahi. Anita, Armin and Artan, who died trying to cross the channel. We pray for those who are unwell and especially remember those who are ill with COVID-19. We pray for your light and love to guide us in all we do in the coming week. Amen. Well, it was great to participate in prayer together for our overseas missionaries. Wonderful. Thanks, Beth and Andy. Let's pray now as we come to focus on the early church who prayed for miracles of freedom. Let's pray for ourselves to know God's love that sets us free from the slavery of sin and the paralysation of fear. Let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you that we can come to you in the knowledge that we are not only loved, but there is no one who will love us more. We come with a sense of gratitude that wells up within us and overflows with thankfulness and joy. We thank you that we can come as we are, knowing we are accepted as we are. Father, we thank you that we can come to be set free from anything and everything that makes us like slaves, from anything and everything that makes us fear. We praise you for your offering to set us free from all our negative attitudes, from our, bro from our broken promises and our sins that get in the way of our relationship with you. Let's now confess anything that gets in the way of our relationship with you. Let's confess our sin for a few moments. And so, Lord, we worship you for setting us free from sin that can so easily enslave us to be guilty and ashamed. We want to move on from those negative emotions and we want to thank you, Lord, for your gracious, restoring nature and that you set captives free. We bring our praise and thanks for your powerful love that brings your light to our darkness and for your perfect love that drives out fear. Amen. Amen. Now let's sing a newer song to many of us called Tremble. And, as, and this song reminds us that in dark places and fearful places like Peter in captivity, that the Lord makes the darkness tremble and brings his light. Bring it all to peace, 
The storm surrounding me, let it break at your name. Still, call these seas to still, the raging me to still every way. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. And Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. Call these bones to live and call these lungs to sing once again. And I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, and Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, cause your name is a light that the shadows can't deny, and your name, it cannot be overcome. Round to the miraculous escape and that's from Acts 12 1 to 17 and we're going to read it shortly but first let's just get that background through the weeks of this sermon series we have seen how the church has grown many moments of church growth occur through the dynamic love-filled moments of good news that bring healing and relationship across cultural barriers We've seen church growth come through dramatic moments of being transformed, like Saul becoming Paul. Saul's eyes are blinded to allow Jesus to challenge why he's persecuting the church. And Saul becomes Paul as his eyes are opened and he transformed to become part of the church's growth. And we see the church scatter as it grows through Samaria, Phoenicia, Cyprus, Cyrene and Antioch. We see Paul's teaching with Barnabas in Antioch for a whole year. And at the heart of much of the church growth is this amazing faith of Peter. Peter's faith, who initiates the first church gathering, calls the church to live in shared community, to worship and have communion with Jesus. The good news of Jesus flows through Peter in words, works and wonders. And Peter, in many ways, is, is such a charismatic leader of the early church. Peter's faith calls so many to be baptised and become disciples of Jesus. Following the Great Commission found in Matthew 28, 16 to 20. And we see Peter in Acts 10 and 11 baptising disciples in Jesus' name with water and the Holy Spirit, and Gentiles were being added to the number in the church in Jerusalem. This great diversity of the church in Jerusalem may well have been a reason why so many of the Jewish religious leaders were getting suspicious and why the church was going to experience yet more persecution. Peter is a key apostle of the church, and so, Capturing Peter and to execute Peter would be to damage the early church seriously. And that is what is at the heart of our passage today. 
we move to this amazing passage of intrigue, politics and drama. Moments of suffering, of weeping, and yet moments of great joy and miracles for the early church. And we have moments of persecution for the church to deal with as we read Acts 12, 1 to 17. And Margie's going to do that for us right now. So reading from Acts 12, starting at verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to, the guard, to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church were earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was due to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two guards, bound with two chains. The sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. The angel told him, Peter followed him out of the prison and he had no idea what, what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They, first, they passed the first and the second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself and they went through it. When they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and he rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people had anticipated. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognised Peter's voice, she was overjoyed and she ran back without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her when she, she kept insisting that it was so. They said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand to them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Tell James and James and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. The miraculous escape. It was an amazing moment, wasn't it? Just hearing that passage, it's so exciting. Let's first meet Herod Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great. Herod the Great tried to kill Jesus soon after he was born. And so Herod Agrippa claimed to be a Jew. His grandfather married a Jewish woman and this gave him a right to become a Jewish king. And so Herod was proclaimed a Jewish king. A right that may have lost him privileges with Rome, but gained political manoeuvring with the Jewish people. Herod moved to the palace in Jerusalem to show his royal status. And he went to the temple every day and he read the law. Herod Agrippa did everything he could to flatter, to win, and be impressive to the Jewish people. Herod's ambitions, of course, were not spiritual, but they were politically driven. He wanted power. 
And so the early life of Jesus was persecuted by Herod and the early church was now persecuted by Herod Agrippa who got a grip on James and Peter. So Herod's first trophy prize for the Jewish people was that of James. And at the start of AD 44, King Herod arrests James. This is the brother of John, one of the sons of Deb Zebedee, known as the Sons of Thunder, a key disciple. And we can read of this in Mark 3, 17. Later in Mark, we see Jesus answering a request from James and John. In Mark 10, 35 to 40, to be held in places of honour by Jesus. But Jesus responds, these places of honour are found through the suffering in his death and resurrection, as he talks of cup and baptism. But Jesus does respond, they will participate in his suffering. Here, James will have been humiliated, tortured and beheaded publicly. Herod charged James with enticing a group that were astray from the worship of God and he would need to be killed with a sword. We can see the law in Deuteronomy 13, 12 to 15 where Herod would have interpreted the law from, from to bring this judgment on James. And it talks of a sword. This was a show trial aimed at demoralising the church to bring popularity with the Jewish people as James is beheaded. This is James. James who was there as Jesus raised Lazarus. James who was there in the garden. James who was even there in the transfiguration, right at the centre of, of the inner circle. James became the first apostle to die, to be martyred for his faith. And this would have been seen by the early church as, as a shocking moment, a shocking moment of grief would have come over them. Shock waves calling them to pray with urgency. And we can read that in Acts 12, 3. You know, this execution brought Herod popularity with the Orthodox Jewish people. And when Herod saw the Jews were pleased by the execution of James, Herod moved to get other disciples executed. And this time it was Peter. Peter, the key leader, if you like, the big fish, the one who, who was at the centre of the church. Herod knew Peter was so important to the church. And when he catches him, his response is he doesn't want to lose him. And so he puts Peter in prison with four squads of soldiers in four by four formation. Peter, round the clock, is guarded by 16 soldiers in shifts, probably of three or four hours, with one of the shifts sleeping while the others guarded. This comes from Acts 12, 4, and he didn't want to take any chances with losing Peter and when we reflect on the number of soldiers we become aware of of how almost overkill this is this is a lot of soldiers Herod may well have heard of the other mysterious prison breaks that the early church had been involved in we can read in Acts 5 23 it says we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the door but when we opened them we found no one inside the early church had been released they were off they were in the temple courts preaching and, uh, and uh, representing Jesus' good news. Jerusalem, you see, at this point as well, was celebrating Passover, a movement of national liberation. And ironically, Peter, a Jew, is held in captivity at this point, languishing in bondage rather than celebrating liberation. But in fact, it does bring his liberation. It does bring uh, his freedom because the feast of unleavened bread that saves Peter from the sword that executed James uh, allows Peter time in prison. The church that gathered in Mary's house 
Well, they would have been desperate at this point. They're grieving for James. They're worried now for Peter and they understood it's only in God that Peter could be broken out, could be broken out of prison now because it was impossible for man to get in there. It was impossible for them to try and break him out. Surely Peter is going to be executed like James. You know, Peter was sleeping between two guards. He was bound in chains. There were sentries at the door guarding the prison. Peter was totally and utterly trapped, chained behind bars and guarded. That very night, Peter's time was nearly up. Passover was nearly over. And the church at this point are utterly desperate. They're bringing life and death prayers. This is a life and death prayer meeting. And in our church history, we have occasionally had those moments of life and death prayer meetings. At uh, the time our church once gathered for prayer for a young Johnny Peacock, uh, an international athlete now, who came to our church as a boy, got meningitis, and uh, he nearly died and the church prayed and he was saved, but he did lose a leg. And this losing of a leg would define his life as a champion international Paralympian. But God on that night again did, saved him, rescued him as church participated in prayer. And there are other times in our church, uh, perhaps we can think of moments uh, of, of members of the fellowship in our church. Pauline, who, who suffered uh, with cancer, uh, and, and prayer meetings occurred and there are others too this is this is just moments of the miraculous nature of God bringing uh, his healing and, and saving power over folk and the early church would have been aware that Peter has been broken out of prison with them before and so I guess they do have that place of faith that they understand that God could do this again and so rather than the physical breakout, the church attempts the spiritual breakout and they pray. The word for prayer here is ekatenos. It's earnestly praying to God with verve, faith as they face death. We find that in Acts 12, 5. The same word used for Jesus' life, death and prayer at Gethsemane. Unremitting, fervent, desperate, pleading prayer for God's rescue. As they pray, Peter is asleep. Yeah, I'll repeat that. They pray, as the church is awake, Peter is asleep. Yet, it's about Peter being executed in the morning. And yet, how chilled is this Houdini? Peter is sleeping. And it is amazing that the church are wide awake, they're praying powerful, fervent prayers as Peter is slumbering. A praying church is a faithful church. And church is called to pray fervently, to wake up the world. Church needs to wake, shake off the chains and begin to witness the impossible, the unexplainable and trust God for the miraculous. And the early church here, with a longing and a hunger, do that. And we are called as a church with longing and hunger to see God move in the impossible, to see God bring divine intervention. Praying for the miraculous is part of the early church's ministry. And we often pray for words, good works, but how often do we pray for wonders to happen? You know, those moments that are only explainable in God. Peter's condition was impossible. It was dark, he was chained, held captive. And in the darkness, a light, a spiritual messenger of God, the angel strikes Peter to awaken him. Ooh. And the angel says, get dressed, as if it's an ordinary day in Acts 12 eh? Peter, unsure if he's seeing a vision. Well, he's in a semi-conscious state. And the change just sort of drop off of him in Acts 12, 7. And Peter just sort of walks through the guard 
as if no one was there with the angel in Acts 12, 9. And Peter comes to the gate and it says the gate opens by itself like an automatic door in Acts 12, 10. You know, this iron gate was very large and heavy and yet it just opens. All in this breakout, there are spiritual moments that go beyond the laws of physics and beyond our comprehension. You know, the angel leaves Peter when Peter is in freedom and Peter has been rescued. In Acts 12, 10, we read of this. Peter, it says, comes out of his trance-like state and immediately gives testimony of God's rescue in Acts 12, 11. Peter is about to bring faith to God's praying people. Now he walks free. And so he decides to go to the headquarters of the early church in Acts 12, 12. This is Mary's house. And many people would gather in Mary's house. It was a big house. We know this because it had an iron gate, which uh, suggests it's, she had quite a bit of money. Uh, and this was a big residence and, and the room would have been filled with the early church and many people were gathered and uh, you know they are praying fervently. At Caleb House, a Christian drug rehab I used to work at and I worked there for, for four years. We used to pray on a Monday at, uh, from eight o'clock till nine as a staff team before the daily house worship occurred from nine till ten o'clock every day. And this prayer meeting was amazing. It was fueled by the fact that we were close as a staff team. We prayed in life and death situations, often praying for the residents, you know, in those moments where they were considering perhaps leaving, going back on the streets, which was a road back to drugs again. And so often our prayers were answered and uh, they, were, you know, they would stay and they would continue on in the drug rehab to finish their programme. Uh, on the, in the rehab and it, it, there were amazing moments of seeing God's hand at work in the miraculous amongst them at times you know for them you know seeing the chains of addiction be broken over nine months there were tangible moments uh, moments again that sometimes just were unbelievable and here these are moments for those that are praying in the, in the early church, they just couldn't believe what was happening. So Peter knocks on the door, a servant girl, girl called Rhoda answers it, and I imagine for Rhoda, answering the door, you know, she would have been worried who this was. The church is being persecuted. Who is this going to be, friend or foe? You know, perhaps we can think in, uh, of other missionary situations, perhaps from the secret, we've heard of secret police turning up and persecuting the church. It's like one of those moments. And so with trepidation, Rhoda goes to the door and she hears Peter's voice. And the amazing thing is it says, she doesn't open the door, she just immediately runs into the main room and just tells everyone, leaving Peter at the door in Acts 12, 14. And, and all the people in the prayer meeting say they can't believe it. They can't actually believe their prayers are being answered. And they say, Rhoda, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. What are you saying? And they all decide, it says, that they think it's Peter's guardian angel in Acts 12, 15 that is at the door. But when they open the door and they see him, they were all astonished. And as they see Peter... Imagine the joy. Imagine the noise. It's a, it's Peter. It's Peter. God has answered our prayers. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. Praise God. Praise God. God has rescued Peter from the impossible situation. And they are going absolutely mad. They are, you know, just, oh, it's just amazing. And Peter, aware that God has rescued him, gives testimony in Acts 12, 17. And these are great moments again where we see the very heart of the passage. It's God that's rescued him. 
and you know Peter wants wants this message to spread he wants faith to be built through these moments as this miracle has happened and he wants it shared and he says uh, to share it with James which is uh, Jesus brother and he was key in the church at that time well in amidst all of that noise it, there's a lovely moment where Peter is aware that he's just escaped from prison and he silences them not wanting them to cause a disturbance in the street and there's lovely moments where we where they would have gone in and they would have celebrated and it then says that Peter left God can still rescue people today in dark places of captivity God can unchain them and release them to be free in miraculous ways and I think we need to pray more often like the early church we need to simply gather at times whether that's together or, or, or on zoom and it's difficult to gather at this point but allow God's strength to rise amongst us as the Spirit empowers us and see the Lord God Almighty move amongst us you know moments of great faith are often products of great spiritual battles every stumbling block must become a stepping stone every opposition must become an opportunity and I think at this point the stepping you know the stumbling blocks and the opposition actually sometimes just feel like being you know in this pandemic for a long time now you know the pandemic has brought darkness to the lives of so many and the pandemic has put restrictions on all of our lives and you know we need to let us be like the early church that we need to pray in life and death situations for the cities the towns and the villages that are in lockdown and for those facing financial ruin the unemployment and those that are losing loved ones and not even been able to see them in their last days let us pray fervently for a vaccine and, and for those facing death and to see divine intervention across the world in what is a time of lament for so many let's pray for the miraculous as the early church did for Peter's re Peter's rescue in an impossible situation and we're going to do that after we've sung the lion and the lamb that reminds us that God comes to save to set captives free and who can stop the Almighty, Lord Almighty when God is moving in powerful ways? Let's sing that song right now together.
Well, it was great to be reminded in The Lion and the Lamb that God is the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And let's end our time together on this online service by praying for the miraculous nature of, of freedom at this time of pandemic and restriction. Let's pray for miracles for those who are suffering at this time particularly because of pandemic, for these impossible situations, like the pos impossible situation the early church prayed for, for Peter. Let's pray to our miraculous God to see miracles. Let's pray firstly. Let's pray for those who are facing death, those who are scared, those who are in pain, those who can't breathe, those who need the Lord's rescue. Lord, may they know the love of, your, of you, Lord Jesus, and the miraculous rescue of you, God, at this time. Amen. And now we pray for those who are suffering through illness, for those whose illness cannot be cured. They're longing for a miracle. May they know your love, Jesus. And may they know the miraculous healing of you, God, in their lives. Amen. We pray for those who suffer because of grief, who have lost someone they deeply love at this time of pandemic. May they know the love of Jesus and the miraculous compassion of God at this time. Amen. We pray for those who suffer because they're supporting, caring, and actually they're just feeling broken by the overwhelming nature of the pandemic. May they know the love of Jesus and the miraculous power of God to keep them going, keep them serving and caring. Amen. And we pray for those who suffer because of the loss of a job. Perhaps they're now in rising debts, financially crippled, and they're perhaps going into lockdown and just don't know any way forward for them. May they know the love of, Lord, of the Lord Jesus and the miraculous direction of God at this time. Amen. And we pray for those who are suffering because of their poverty. Those that don't know where their next meal is coming from in this time of pandemic. May they know the love of Jesus and the miraculous provision of God. Amen. And we pray for those who are suffering anxiety or fear at this time of pandemic who feel broken, paralysed by fear, and long from that freedom, from the anxiety. May they know the love of Jesus and the miraculous presence of God with them. Amen. And finally, we pray that as we hear and witness God's miraculous nature, we might learn to share it like Peter with others, build faith, and live being aware of the love of Jesus and the miraculous nature of God. Amen. And it was great to pray together today. And now we come to a blessing to end our time together. Heavenly Father, help us fix our minds on Jesus our hearts on his glory, our eyes on his purposes, and our ears on his voice. May the church be filled with the Spirit as people of God. Amen.